We've all heard of women's intuition, right? Well, men have intuition as well. Intuition is so important when it comes to feeding ourselves and our families in our challenging food environment. This podcast explores a variety of topics related to a powerful, evidence-based eating framework called intuitive eating that integrates instinct, emotion, and rational thought. My hope is that it will help you finally break free of the perpetual diet cycle. This is the Men's Intuition Podcast. All right, and welcome back to another episode of the Men's Intuition Podcast. Today, we have a very special guest on. We have Dr. Greg Dodell, and he is a board-certified endocrinologist. He received his medical degree from Albany Medical College. He completed his internal medicine and endocrinology fellowship at St. Luke's Roosevelt Hospital. Uh, center uh, affiliated with Columbia University, and he is in private practice at Central Park Endocrinology PC. So now before we dive in and before I let him kind of introduce himself a little more, I do want to just add a quick disclaimer here. While we do have a medical doctor on the show today, please understand this is not personalized medical advice. This is for informational and educational purposes only. So if you have any questions at all or any concerns about your own health, please, please, please speak with your personal medical care team. Don't make any changes based on anything that we are talking about here today. This is to give you some things to bring up with your medical care team if if uh, something is interests you. But keep in mind, again, this is not uh, personalized medical advice. So all right. Well, welcome. Thank you. And thanks for, for making that statement. Cause I think that's, that's certainly important. You know, yeah. there's a lot of good information out there, whether it's, you know, on the internet, podcasts, magazines, whatever, but yeah, seriously, you know, this is just meant to be information. So I think that's important to take note of. Yeah. There's so many factors that come into play with, well, with medical care, especially, but even with nutrition, which is always frustrating for a nutritionist like myself, when I see people in Facebook groups, just sort of say, uh, what's, what are your tips for losing weight? And they just start throwing out random things without knowing where the person's coming from and if they have right. an eating disorder totally. and all those totally. factors. So, yes. Yeah. Yes. So, well, why don't you tell us a bit about who you are, uh, kind of what you do as an endocrinologist. And, and in that intro, um, tell us also what you mean by something that I saw in one of your very entertaining IG reels, where you referred to your practice as providing non-judgmental care. I thought that was a great way of putting it. Okay. Um, so thanks for having me, first of all. Uh, my name is Greg Goodell, as, as the intro said. I am from Los Angeles, California originally, but always gravitated and loved New York. My dad is from New York, uh, the New York area. So I always came back as a, as a kid and I went to a sports summer camp in the East coast. So yeah, here I am in New York and, uh, my wife works in a similar field as a psychologist and she's from New York. So here I am and uh, I'm happy to be in private practice here in Manhattan. And I don't know, I growing up, I always wanted to be a doctor, which I'm grateful for being able to keep that that dream going and also just always gravitated to the idea of being in private practice and like an old school doctor and really knowing my patients and following them throughout the course of their life and um i don't do house calls but like you get the picture yeah. like that kind of that kind of medicine and uh and i love what i do and i i chose endocrinology because i find that it affects the whole system the whole body and this not only is the science interesting, but if you can make a diagnosis and there's treatments available, you can really improve someone's quality of life. So um, I'm happy that I'm able to do it. Yeah. So what's this uh, non-judgmental care? Is that something that would be that's typical in your field or in the medical industry, you know, medical field in, in particular? I don't know. I mean, I can't speak for how other people practice, right. but but I can say that for me. You know, we see patients and and it's not just about numbers. It's not just about, you know, what's going on with them in that 15 minutes or 30 minutes that they're in front of me. It's about what's happening in their life and knowing their stressors and what's going on at home and going on at work and things like that. And we all have so many things going on. And I think that not judging you know someone's results and whatever and just being like, all right, well, how can we work within the parameters? of what's going on with your life to help you because I'm really just here to work with the person. So I think obviously if I judge that they show up in their cholesterol or their blood sugar or their 
blood pressure aren't where I think it should be or where it could be, I think people are going to feel that. And obviously that doesn't lead to good outcomes. So I think non-judgmental care hopefully would lead to better outcomes because the people are going to want to come back and, and find a way to work with you um, towards that goal. Yeah, definitely. I think that, you know, that that impacts whether people are going to seek out medical care prior to actually needing it, prior to showing up in an emergency room where right. they they have no other choice but to to go there. And when they can can get things checked out earlier on, then then you can deal with them earlier on and, and not wait until they become an emergent situation. Right. I mean, I think that it's, we're all human and I think it's human nature that if you're going to go into a clinical situation and feel judged for whatever reason, whether it's, you know, not taking the medications or not meeting whatever metrics that you're supposed to be doing or not exercising as much as, you know, was prescribed, um, we're going to try and avoid that situation because that's just a defense mechanism. So, you know, I, I clearly, you know, would try and partner with the people and say, look, all right, you didn't do the things that we thought maybe that you could have worked on and uh, fine. So let's, let's look at some other way to do it. Yeah, I think that's great. Now, when it comes to, uh, you know, one of the things that that makes you stand out on social media anyway, because you, you do provide some great education. You also provide some great entertainment with your dance videos. And um, but with that, you you talk a lot about uh, kind of a weight neutral approach, weight inclusive approach, um, health at every size uh, to the, the way that you provide medical care. And that's I think that at least from what I have seen with other endocrinologists around and the medical field in, you know, kind of in general, is that that's not always the uh, the typical approach that's taken. Uh, maybe you could talk a little bit about what um, how that maybe looks different, uh, kind of a weight neutral approach and how you approach that body weight, I guess, since that, that's, that's often associated with a lot of the things that you deal with as a physician. Yeah, no, I mean, that's that's a great question. And I think for me, it goes along the lines, at least somewhat about the non judgmental approach, because there's so much judgment, you know, often even self inflicted um, about weight and, you know, any kind of lifestyle things. And then weight tends to be tied with lifestyle, although we know the majority of it is genetic. But um a lot has come out in the research about weight stigma. And we know that weight stigma is detrimental to people's health. And I think people feel that when they go to a doctor's office and are in that situation. And we know people avoid going to the doctor's office because of that, whether they feel judged or not. But even if the objective, even a non judgmental approach is about weight as the objective, I think, you know, people avoid going. So I think just a blanket statement of coming in and saying, you know, I practice from this weight inclusive standpoint, I'm not going to focus on weight, I'm going to focus on actual behaviors, hopefully makes people feel more comfortable and, and wanting to come and, and partner up on improving health. And yes, the weight, of course, may change, but that's not a behavior. And I think that just making that distinction is really important. I was just looking at some data from the look ahead study. Um, which for people that aren't aware, that's a lifestyle intervention study. And it showed that a change in weight is associated with decrease in blood pressure and improved blood sugar and, and glycemic control, it's called. And my question, you know, when I look at these papers is, well, what caused the weight change? And it was really, you know, the specifics of the study I'd have to read up more on, but I'm assuming it's like moving more, changing eating patterns and all these things. Um, so people are quick to like grab weight as like the main thing that caused that change in blood pressure or the change in blood sugar. But shouldn't weight just be paired in that same category as like the outcome, not the intervention? So that's what I try and kind of tease out with my patients and say, look, even irrespective of changes in weight, if you focus on health promoting behaviors, you're going to probably see better health outcomes. And that's maybe how it looks different, you know? Yeah. So much of, of what we hear in the fitness industry and the medical industry and public health messaging is based on that, that body, body weight centered 
um, outcome. It's as if that is the number one factor for improving your health and for you know living a healthy lifestyle. And if well, and then of course that you know the appearance goals and those kinds of things, which would be a whole other discussion. But I think it's really interesting. I, I wish I had the paper in front of me. I can't remember who it is, but it was a it was a study that was fairly recent where they looked at increases in physical activity. And they, what they noted was improved, uh, and it, this one was particularly looking at hepatic fat, so liver fat. And they were found that there were improvements in liver fat accumulation uh, in the absence of changes in BMI simply from increasing physical activity. And these weren't like ex you know, crazy training programs. These were just getting up and moving more and becoming a bit more active. And so I think that those are those are important things to consider because not everybody can well, we know that most people can lose weight, but it, keeping it off long term is is not something that we we see happening much um, on a regular basis. Right. You may be alluding to uh, a paper by Gazer, or at least maybe. So that was a review article with over 200 references, which looked at physical activity and, and fitness, which showed irrespective of changes in weight, there was an improvement in cardiometabolic markers, such as insulin levels, C-reactive protein, which is an inflammatory um, marker, maybe, you know, liver enzymes, things like that. Um, so, I mean, if there's 200 some odd references in there, I think that's pretty conclusive that just by moving more, finding ways to get more protein and fiber and all these things um, as nutrition will have big health outcomes. And the data is showing also that weight cycling is actually more detrimental um, to people's health than maybe staying at a higher weight, um, even in terms of mortality. I mean, death and cardiovascular disease. So that yo-yoing, which is the most common outcome of going on a restrictive diet, is worse than just saying, I'm going to do these behaviors and see where my weight falls. If it changes, fine. If it doesn't, fine. Um, but what are the real goals here? Yeah, I think that's really important. And it's not just physical, uh, it, physical health that comes into play with that, too, is that that yo-yo dieting and that constant up and down weight change is, is a, takes a mental toll, an emotional toll on a lot of people. And you know, I've talked before on, on some social media posts about when I did one of those transformation challenges a number of years back where you get super lean and take a before and after picture and. And then I got to a place that was completely unsustainable. I even knew it intellectually going into it. But then as soon as I started gaining some weight again, that basically returning to a healthy, <laughs> to a healthy amount of body fat, um, I just, I started to see myself different. And, and I was like, you know, you almost start getting these feelings of, oh, I'm letting myself go a little bit and, oh, maybe I should tighten things up again. And so even apart from that, the physical toll that that stuff can take, that um, that weight stigma that you said, that self stigma that we have also like, oh, man, I remember, you know, I, when I was 30, I looked this way. I'd love to look that way again. And, you know, and all of those things that just the emotional toll that can take on people. Yes, yes, absolutely. And getting on the scale, however often someone's getting on the scale and seeing, you know, it's up or down and, and letting that dictate you know, the day and, and what does that take away from, from your life and your purpose and what you could be focusing on instead, um, rather than being so focused on that number or what you should or shouldn't be eating. Um, we have a great system, you know, our internal sensors and we just, you can speak more to this than I can, but like intuitive eating and just listening to our body and not needing all these external factors to tell us, Hey, you know, you shouldn't eat this amount of calories or carbs or you need this amount of protein and, and whatever. And, you know, I would just throw it back to you and say, how did you feel, you know, not only emotionally, like going through that roller coaster, but also like, how'd you feel physically? I mean, even when you were at like the super ripped stage, but like so restrictive, like, did you feel lethargic? Did you, how was your mood? And, you know, cause I hear when people are on these restrictive diets, they're tired, they're cranky, you know. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah, that that was the worst that I felt. Um, 
you know, through that process, the leaner I got toward the end there. And, and you hear this from bodybuilders who are prepping for a show toward the end there. They just feel terrible. Their libido is in the tank. Uh, they are constantly thinking about food. So food is just constantly on your mind. You're always thinking, when's my next meal? Can't wait for cheat day. Can't wait for for uh, to get some carbs in. And, uh, you know, the, I'm, the first thing I did after I took my uh, after photos was I went and ate candy and pizza and stuff like that. And it's just, um, yeah, it just, it takes a toll. Yeah. Like I don't, I don't think that's healthy. No, <laughs> you, know, like, <laughs> you know, like maybe like, you know, the blood sugar was probably low and your blood pressure maybe was good, but like you felt terrible. And like, all you could think about was like when you could like binge out and like whatever, I can't imagine that that's healthy in the, in the long run. So if the goal is indeed, health rather than like that after picture which may not always be the case and that's fine but let's just be clear you know on like is this about health or is this about like how you're going to look in the bathing suit yeah and it's really interesting because it was one of these things where there where there was a large group of people doing it, it was kind of a competition and so everybody was was talking about it in terms of getting healthier, getting health you know, from health perspective and also talking about aesthetics, but there was much more talk about health. And then mm -hmm. after the fact that, you know, years later, I look back and I think there was nothing healthy about it. Right. Uh, you know, there just, there just wasn't. And, and I think there's that, that perception oftentimes that, that the leanest people are the healthiest. And, and in fact, that's just not the, the case. Yeah, I mean, I hear it from patients a lot, you know, who are recovering, recovered from eating disorders. And they say, I've weighed much less in my life than I do now. And I was never more sick than I was at my lowest weight. Yeah. Yeah. I can you know, imagine. So, yeah. Now, how, did you always take kind of this weight neutral approach to medicine or was that a change? Because I know that's not the typical thing taught in medical school. Yeah, total change. Um, I'll use this as a as an intro to to my wife, um, Alexis Connison, who is um, the anti diet plan on social media, and we both she's a psychologist, and we both trained in similar backgrounds, and we were in the same hospital, and she was studying doing her research on bariatric surgery, and so we we're both very weight focused. You know that was our training. She came out, we both went into private practice and she was doing bariatric surgery evaluations and kept hearing from all her post bariatric surgery patients and other patients who were binge eating and all this stuff. Um, the same stuff that we're talking about that just, you know, became so clear to her. And she was introduced to Hayes probably, I don't know, five, 10 years ago and kept telling me about it and being like, you really got to look at this and how you're practicing and all this stuff. And, um, it finally clicked, you know, I read, I read her book, um, which came out like a year or so ago, the diet free revolution and all the research laid out on all the things that we're talking about. And finally, I, after like a decade, I got it, but it, it's hard, you know, cause you're so entrenched in your training and like every email I read and every journal I pick up, it's like so, so much about the weight. It's like really hard to separate it out. and you know, seeing a patient with diabetes, like, and being able to say, you can eat carbohydrates, you know, eat whatever you want. Let's like figure out, you know, the medication and this is genetic. It's not your fault. And it's just very different from, you know, the general way that I was trained and one's not necessarily right or wrong. I'll say, you know, it's just a individual approach and, and what works for some patients in front of me may not work for others. And, you know, that's the beauty of healthcare. You can, at least in, you know, here in the U S you can go find someone that works with what your goals are. Yeah. And I think that's great that there's, there's doctors like you. And I think there's more gradually coming on the scene who are taking that approach, which is good to see because, um, you know, going back to that, that psychological, emotional health and being willing to go seek out medical care. I'm sure that for so many people, they feel relieved when they hear that. I, I know I felt that with clients who came to me. I, I remember a 
12 year old boy, the, the parents brought him to me to give him a diet and exercise plan. And I said, we don't do that. We're not going to focus on weight loss and I'm not putting you on a diet. I'm going to help your parents learn about your feeding relationship and I'm going to help you learn about how to feed yourself well. And he got just this big grin and high fived his mom even. And so there was yeah. just this huge sense of relief on on his part. And do you do you uh, experience that with patients when you don't stick them on a diet and uh, that sense of relief? Yeah, totally. I mean, you know, I think people come in with that expectation that that's what I'm going to do is say you need to diet and exercise because that's you know just what's out there in society. And I think also so many assumptions are made based on appearance, you know, if someone's in a larger body, you know, people assume that they're not moving the same way that they're not, you know, that they're going and having all this food, you know, and eating differently and all this stuff, which a good percentage of the time when I ask someone without assuming things, they're moving, they're eating, you know, and, and the same, and the same could be true of like someone in a, you know, a different size body, a smaller body that they may never exercise and they may not eat, you know, quote unquote is healthy, but you know, the assumption is that they do because they're thinner. So, you know, I think, I think people are happy when I kind of just break that down and take away any assumption and like straight up ask. And I ask people in larger bodies, if they have, what's their relationship with food, any history of disordered eating. And a lot of them are like, I'm in a larger body. Like, of course, I've been on every diet, you know, ever invented because that's what the expectation is. And um, and just having these conversations, I think people really appreciate, you know, and. Uh, you know, yeah, that's great. I uh, really appreciate doctors like you who are, who are taking that approach and kind of going against the typical flow even though what we're talking about today is completely evidence based it's just a it's a different way of interpreting a lot of the 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 research that's out there you know intuitive eating for example is a very evidence based approach to to improving health through through nutrition right i mean how many decades have we been working to for lack of a better term like shrink the population you know but the the people's body weights continue to go up um fine you know but like wh what's going on and like what's not working if that if that's the objective is to like shrink people's bodies which i'm not saying that it is whatever like the message is is like having the reverse effect if your objective is to make people smaller which you know, i don't necessarily agree with but you know and then i'm seeing like teenagers you know being put on things like fentermine potentially and like stimulants to lose weight kids are like still growing and like you're giving them like amphetamines to shrink them down instead of saying like all right what's the behavior or like maybe this is genetic and like you're just in a larger body you have no health problems okay maybe you're at a higher risk let's just watch you know maybe you have a family history of diabetes or whatever but like to introduce medications and someone who's like growing and going through puberty and all this stuff strictly just based on the number on the scale i'm just worried about the long-term implications you know not only physically but psychologically for those kids yeah it's very short-sighted because you you're you know everybody grows at a different rate and in different ways and some people put on some fat before they have a growth spurt and that's fine and other people grow tall and get super skinny before they kind of fill back out and and uh yeah it's just it's it's very individual and it's unfortunate that we all think everybody is supposed to grow precisely at the average you know you look at the okay here's here's the top end here's the low end the average everybody wants to be at the 50th percentile on the growth curve right right but like where do those growth yeah where do those growth curves come from like if you look at bmi which was never intended to be like an individual individualized thing it was all based on like white european men you know as like a population study right which we know um and then you're taking like black women and people that are very muscular and have different distribution of fat and men versus women are obviously built differently in different genetics and using that standard, which I think thankfully most people are realizing is just 
not a good marker at all. Um, and then saying to a kid who's like still growing or whatever, hey, you know, you need to lose weight. You know, what are the long term implications of that? I think it's dangerous. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Well, uh, again, I'm reminding our listeners, this is not specific medical advice here, but I wanted to ask you, what about conditions like type 2 diabetes? Uh, you know, obviously, as an endocrinologist dealing with hormones, um, these are some of the conditions you deal with a lot. Type 2 diabetes, PCOS, low testosterone, or maybe other hormonal issues, thyroid problems, uh, maybe cardiometabolic issues that are related to hormones, um, all these different things that... Um, uh, uh, you know, individuals, medical community, public health messaging often assume to be causal effects of higher BMIs. Um, and clearly, we've already kind of addressed the last part of that. But, uh, you know, I assume you don't believe that a higher BMI is an unher inherently unhealthy. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think you can't look at BMI. I just yeah. think that, you know, you, you've had a really muscular patient they could have a high bmi you know we'll get like football players or wherever you know um or someone who has more subcutaneous fat which people don't know could be like gluteal fat arm fat it's not this visceral like intra-abdominal fat that maybe has more of a metabolic um risk factor associated with it so the i mean you said like a causal relationship i i just think that it's really hard to prove causation in a lot of these studies because you have to look at things like weight stigma. Um, you have to look at things like weight cycling, which is more prevalent in people in larger bodies, which we know, which we talked about, the weight cycling in and of itself increases inflammatory markers and blood sugar and insulin levels and things like that. So you have to look at all these variables. And if a study doesn't look at things like fitness and nutrition and even like income level and stressors and all these things, it's very tough to say, like, it's just the weight. You know, I think the media and whoever are very quick to grab onto any changes in weight in the quote unquote right direction. Well, it must be the weight that caused this good outcome um, versus the other. If someone gains weight, they're quick to put blame on it. But as I started with, weight is not the behavior. Like, what are the behaviors that are either causing the weight to go up or down? If weight goes up, is it because the person wasn't moving as much, they weren't getting enough sleep or whatever, and maybe that's what causes the blood pressure and blood sugar to go up. If the weight goes down, what are the behaviors that cause that? And maybe that's the cause, not the association with the change in weight. So that, that's kind of my, you know, the way I look at it. And also, like recently I started hearing about, you know, maybe insulin resistance is preceding weight gain. So maybe it's the insulin resistance you know, on a genetic, biochemical, cellular level that is actually leading to the weight gain, not the other way around, um, which I know is getting a little bit in the weeds here. But like people are quick to say, well, people in larger bodies are insulin resistant. So if you lose weight, the insulin resistance goes down. But maybe it's the insulin resistance that causes cravings and all the other things that go on that increase weight. And you really have to deal with the behaviors and the genetics of the insulin resistance rather than the weight. The weight is the byproduct. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. And that's something that that's often overlooked is we it's really easy for us to fall into this think way of thinking where we look at this causal relationship between things. And, you know, I, I think of uh, a medical condition. My wife has several uh, chronic medical conditions, and one of them is idiopathic intracranial hypertension. So she has too much spinal fluid pressure in her brain. and um, typically most, I think it's 80 or 85% of people are women of childbearing age who fall into the category of, of obesity. And so the assumption is, oh, well, it's because they are larger body that they develop this condition. So often the, the treatment approach is lose weight. But uh, so many people have actually had their symptoms exacerbated when they lost weight and other people have lost weight and seen no changes. And some people have lost weight and seen changes. But um, my, my whole point in bringing that up is if, if if sustained weight loss is not something that can be accomplished very easily, you know, that that focusing on that that weight loss outcome rather than other ways of treating the the condition it is not likely going to be something that's going to really provide long-term treatment or relief 
of that condition. The same would be true of of type two diabetes, for example. You know, if you you know, whatever the causal relationship is, if you can't sustain the weight loss anyway, and the cycling is going to make it worse, then focusing on that weight loss can be really problematic. Yeah, it's tough because we all have this set point, you know, of our weight. And yes, obviously, you know, if the trend has gone up in weight as a result of like certain behaviors, whatever those behaviors may be, changing those behaviors, which may then get the weight back to whatever that baseline is, clearly may be associated with change in sugars and things like that. But if someone's at their, you know, in their window of like what their weight's supposed to be, supposed to be genetically, which is maybe at a higher level than, you know, this BMI construct, which was never intended for them to begin with, you know, forcing them to get below whatever their set point is, you know, the metabolism starts slowing down, ghrelin, which is an appetite hormone, starts kicking in. All these things happen as a defense mechanism for the body to stay at where it's programmed to be, you know, fighting against that. So, and again, that's like what we were talking about before, like the before and after pictures, like, you know, is that healthy, you know? I was just thinking when you were talking about ghrelin and you didn't mention leptin, but leptin tanks also when you start losing a lot of body weight. And Uh boy, when I was toward the end there, I know my my ghrelin was probably through the roof and my leptin was probably in the the toilet because I was just. Those hormones also, you know, change with sleep, Mm -hmm. you know, um, some of the most interesting research on appetite uh, is in sleep deprivation you know these studies where they take people in their 20s and they sleep deprive them for like a week Mm -hmm. and then they study cortisol and ghrelin and leptin and thyroid levels and testosterone all these things and just showing like the inverse relationship you know is unbelievable yeah you know what's what's fascinating with those those sleep deprivation studies is a lot of them that when you really look at the the details of it some of these sleep you know the, the sleep deprived i'm putting air quotes there if you're not watching the video, but there are like five or six hours of sleep a night. So we're not talking about like one or two hours or not letting him sleep for days. We're talking about a typical American sleep pattern for many, many you know busy people, um, this five or six hours a night chronically. And, you know, that's one of those behaviors that you're talking about that you can see some dramatic improvements in your health by just getting another hour or two of sleep a night if if it's something that you're able to to do and um certainly much easier than than trying to sustain weight loss long term yeah so um when you deal with like when you're treating patients do you treat those in a larger body uh, do would you approach a treatment plan in a different way for someone in a larger body versus a smaller body or do you generally in your practice now approach everyone kind of from that same um that same standpoint regardless you know setting aside their body size i use the same i use the same medications i Mm -hmm. talk about the same behaviors i look at the lab values the same way you know Mm -hmm. and that's just how i practice i mean i i think that you know if there was ever a study done which maybe it has been done if someone just had like lab values up and, you know, one had like high blood pressure or high sugar, or, you know, high cholesterol and whatever. And like the BMI was like hidden mm-hmm. or not, or like the weight was hidden. Most clinicians would like assume that the one who has like, quote unquote, like worse labs or more abnormal labs would be someone in, you know, a larger body. And I don't think that that's necessarily true yeah um and i see people across the size spectrum with type 2 diabetes and pcos and all these things so yeah i recommend the same things you know yeah Yeah, i think it's interesting this is just uh, you know a miscellaneous anecdote but um my late wife was quite large and when she had breast cancer they put her in the hospital and did all these tests and they were shocked that the only problem she had was sleep apnea her blood all her all her biomarkers were great, uh, all of that. Uh, me, I've always been very thin. And at the time I was uh, comp- competing in karate and my cholesterol was borderline. And I also had sleep apnea. So we kind of mm-hmm. joked about how the fact that, you know, <laughs> you ba- our, she was sort of stereotyped as someone who might have sleep apnea and those blood issues. But yet 
I was the one that actually had the worst, um, the, yeah. the worst blood markers. So it was, it was kind of an interesting. I'm sorry to hear about her. Yeah. Yeah. Well, that was, sorry for your that loss. was, uh, that was back in 2010. So, um, my wife, I mentioned was, earlier, yeah, yeah. even yeah. if it was like 1990, whatever. <laughs> exactly. you know, it's yeah, definitely. Sure. Sorry yeah. about that. Yeah. I appreciate that. But, um, yeah. So what are some ways then that people can significantly improve their overall health as well as kind of better manage some of these conditions? I know we've kind of touched on them a little bit, but maybe we can kind of specifically focus the, la the last part of our, our chat on that. And, um, you know, without dieting and without focusing on weight loss and and maybe maybe specifically we can talk about some of those that are the big biggies that people are usually concerned about which is type 2 diabetes prediabetes and cardiovascular disease yeah so i mean i think for anyone that follows either one of us on social media you're going to hear about sleep you know which we talked about you're going to hear about movement and, and i mean movement not like a chore movement that's fun that's enjoyable that you're going to do um, if something's a chore and you're not going to stick with it or it's painful or whatever, I don't think that that's going to be productive long term. Yeah. Dancing on Instagram reels is definitely one way of moving, right? Yes. Yes. <laughs> um, feel free to remix any of my reels um, if you want to have fun. Um, <laughs> and then um, nutrition. I talk about nutrition, which you can speak more than I can, is about adding in things that we know mm -hmm. are good for us fruits and vegetables, good sources of fat and protein, not subtracting things because, right. you know, that leads to a restriction. And then it leads to like after the after photo with the six pack of like going to have whatever candy and blah, blah, blah. So if it's about health, it's about adding things in that research shows are effective um, and helpful for us. And then stress management, I think, is, is certainly under discussed, under looked at, you know, yeah. in, in terms of health. Um, because of cortisol and the effect of on testosterone and blood sugar and blood pressure and all these things. So if you're stressed, you know, be, you know, intuitive with yourself and get some help, see a therapist, like figure out how to manage the stress. I have a meditation practice, which helps me a lot and, uh, and find a way to, to get out and have some fun and have things to look forward to. Because if you're stressed, it's, it's not going to be good, you know, long term. Yeah. You know, for any any part of you, health wise, psychologically, anything. You know, we uh, life is short. You know, let's mm -hmm. let's find ways to enjoy it. Yeah, and those things aren't shiny and fancy and marketable, but they they work. It's amazing, just those those changes and and the impact they have physically and psychologically, emotionally, spiritually, socially. And and you, just thinking about it, you know, what do all those things have in common? It's that if we actually just sit down with ourselves for like a couple minutes and look at ourselves with a lens, you know, and be real with ourselves. We can do all that without someone else telling us what we should be doing. Like yeah. you're tired in the morning. It doesn't take a genius to be like, Hey, if I got an extra hour of sleep, I'd probably feel better. Yeah. Or like, you know, you're bloated and like your stomach's upset after a certain kind of food. Doesn't take a genius to be like, hey, you know, maybe next time I would choose the other thing. Mm -hmm. um, your heart rate's through the roof and you're flushed and like, you know, all tense. Doesn't take a genius to be like, maybe I should do something to manage my stress. Yeah. Yeah, really good points. You know, one other thing, and this falls under the, the medical care thing, that this one just popped into my head. And I have a good friend who doesn't take his insulin because he doesn't like needles. And so take your medication. If you're, if you're on medication to help with a medical condition, that's another health yeah. promoting behavior that totally. is independent of your, your weight changes that, you know, if you're <clears throat> a lot of people talk about, Oh, you want to get off your medications and everything should be natural and all this, but these medications that, that you guys prescribe are, are beneficial and, and in many ways can help someone improve their quality of life metformin or insulin if you need that and all of these medications i, I know there's a lot of stigma attached to trying to taking these you know that'd be a whole other conversation but i think that's a really important health promoting behavior too because i've I've read some studies about about that kind of thing too yeah yeah we start off by saying you know my non-judgmental approach which is what i aim for mm -hmm. um 
And, you know, if people need medication, there's nothing wrong with that. A lot of these conditions we're talking about are genetic. And yes, there are associations with type 2 diabetes, certainly in lifestyle and whatever. But that doesn't mean you can't do all these behaviors that we're talking about Mm -hmm. to try and improve your numbers. But that doesn't mean that if you have to take medication in conjunction, there's anything wrong with that. I mean, the point is to feel as good as possible, to be as healthy as possible. And often that requires medication, even with like things like anxiety and depression. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know, the combination of therapy with medication is often going to be better than either one alone. Yeah, that's so important. Yeah, that would we could we could go on for hours about all of these different things. But I think that's that um, all these points that we've talked about today are just really important. And um, I, I just wanted to you know thank you so much for your time to come on and and share your insight as a, a physician. Uh, I think one of the things that that my hope is with this is that uh, men who are listening to this podcast, of course, I have women listeners also, but really everyone who's listening to this podcast that that you'll hear from a doctor that you don't have to focus on your weight if um, if you have some of these typically weight associated conditions that that focusing on those behaviors and your other the other aspects of health like your social and intellectual and economic and and spiritual and psychological and emotional all those other facets of health they're just as important and often we can really improve our overall well-being so much more if we will address all the facets of health rather than just this narrow fixation on changing the size and shape of our body. Yes, totally. Yeah. Well, how can people learn more about you and your work, your medical practice? Um, Feel free to plug your wife's book also. I haven't read it yet, but it's on my list, uh, my to-do list. (laughs) Yeah, no. um, So, right. So Alexis Connison at the Anti-Diet Plan and her book is Diet Free Revolution. Um, So you can get that. Mm -hmm. And uh, it's also an audible. And for me, I'm everything underscore endocrine on Instagram. Twitter, I don't use that much, but Dodell MD. And my practice is Central Park Endocrinology. All right. Great. Yeah, I definitely encourage anybody listening to go follow his uh, Instagram account. There's great content on there. Um, nice, short, t- very um, directed points that he makes. And then also a little entertainment here and there with his dance videos. So, uh, yeah. So, again, thank you so much for your time. And thank you. Um, look forward to continuing to follow your work online and maybe catch up again later down the road sometime. That'd be great. Hope you have a great weekend. And to all the listeners out there, thank you so much for listening. And uh, we look forward to bringing you another episode again soon. 